Today we're bringing you the story of a young college student whose body is found in a remote field. For years, law enforcement has been on the trail of her killer. And in a dramatic twist, while we were in the middle of producing this episode, an arrest is made. After 20 years, did police finally catch her killer? This is APB Cold Case. Here's your host, former police chief Mark Spahn. On the morning of Thursday, March 13, 2003, 20-year-old Megan McDonald wakes up in her new apartment located on Karen Road in the town of Wallkill, New York. She had recently moved out of her parents' house, which was a really big deal for her. Megan adores her close-knit family, but she's also excited to experience her independence as a young adult. So on that chilly morning, Megan gets ready for work and heads to her job as a waitress at the American Cafe in the Galleria Mall. Megan is fair-skinned with dark hair and a big, beautiful smile, and she's popular with both co-workers and customers alike. She's described by friends and family as having a bubbly personality, a beautiful person inside and out. It's just another normal day at the restaurant. Megan finishes her shift and says goodbye to her co-workers. She's scheduled to work again the following day, but the next day, Megan never shows up. Here's Lieutenant Brad Natalizio of the New York State Police. She was scheduled to return to work early in the morning on March 14th, but she didn't show up to work. Um, her job called her, several of her friends called her, um, her mother called her in a panic. Ultimately, they were trying to find where she was. It's now Friday, March 14th. Megan's friends and co-workers might be wondering where she is, but her family knows that something's wrong. It's uncharacteristic for her just to not show up for work. Their repeated calls to her cell phone go unanswered. Where is Megan? That question is answered the next day when her family gets the devastating news. Megan's bludgeoned body has been found in a remote field less than five miles from her apartment. The community was in shock and Megan's family was rocked to their core. How could this have happened? Who could have killed Megan and why? It was incomprehensible. The family was still reeling from the death of Megan's father, retired NYPD detective Dennis McDonald, the previous year from a sudden heart attack. And now their beloved Megan is gone. Police begin their investigation at the scene and Megan's body is sent for autopsy. Investigators need to get to know who Megan was. Hopefully that will lead them to a possible suspect. Again, here's Lieutenant Brad Natalizio. She was a 20-year-old college student at SUNY Orange. That's what she was on, on paper, and that's what she is in the newspaper every year. But working this case, and you really get to know her, who she was as a person. You kind of get the same repetitive theme from not only talking to the family, but talking to all her friends. She got along with everybody. She lit up a room when she walked in. But then she also hung out with just a, a wide variety of people. She was friends with everybody. If you met her, you became friends with her, is what we hear time and time again. That also did lead to some challenges in the case, especially early on, because this is a person that is very popular and has a large, large group of friends. So in the beginning, when there's a lot of unknowns, there's also a lot of individuals, names may pop up, many interviews that needed to be conducted. But she was a beautiful person inside and out from, from all accounts and a great friend, a, a great daughter, a great sister. It's clear that Megan was well-loved by her family, her wide group of friends, and her community. So why would someone kill her? To find that answer, please start building a timeline of the hours leading up to her death. According to court documents filed by state police, on March 9, 2003, five days before she was murdered, Megan received a disturbing voicemail from a male caller saying, Yo, just drove by your crib and seen he was there. Holler back at me when you get this message. Megan saved that voicemail, and the voice would later be identified by several witnesses as being that of Edward Holly. Megan and Edward Holly had been involved in a romantic relationship, and police say that Megan tried to end that relationship several days before her murder. On March 10th, the day after the voicemail, Megan and Edward Holly had an argument. According to the police complaint, this assertion is supported by Edward Holly's own interviews with law enforcement, as well as from witness statements. According to those same documents, Holly said that this was the last time he saw Megan. 
So police continue to learn more about Edward Holly. But let's go back to the timeline. Here's Lieutenant Brad Natalizio. In March 1st, Megan actually moved into a new apartment. She was eager to start her life as a, as a young adult. She moved out of her residence and she moved into a new apartment by herself. So she was only in there for a little less than two weeks. So the morning of March 13th, 2003, she woke up at approximately nine o'clock a.m. Her landlord could hear Megan downstairs in the residence. Megan was seen leaving her apartment a short time later with her new boyfriend. It was about an hour later, 10 a.m., when the new boyfriend stated that Megan dropped him off at his residence. And that's the last time he sees Megan. Again, here's Lieutenant Natalizio. From there, she, she went to work. She arrived at work, her job at around 10.30 a.m., where she was a waitress at the American Cafe in the Gallery Mall that's also in the town of Wallkill. She worked till about 3.30 or so, at which point she then went to the HSBC Bank, which is also in the town of Wallkill. We asked Lieutenant Natalizio to describe the area. Town of Wallkill is a unique town. It's very diverse when it comes to the geography. It has a very large commercial district, one of the larger commercial districts in, in Orange County. It has rural areas, and it has more of a suburban environment as well. So investigators know that Megan left work on March 13th after 3 p.m. And then at about 3.32 p.m., Megan makes a deposit into her account at the HSBC Bank in Wallkill. We feel that that trip to the bank was significant. Recent evidence has determined that there was significant issue with her going to that bank. There's a gap in the timeline after Megan leaves the HSBC bank in the three o'clock hour. Perhaps she went home to change out of her work clothes. Lieutenant Natalizio picks it up from there. At around seven o'clock p.m., that's really our, our next plotting point when it comes to her timeline. She pulled up in her vehicle, she pulled up the area uh, on Greenway Terrace. There was a party. She was friends with individuals who were having the party uh, at that location, at which point when she pulled up to the, the residence, two individuals walked out and had a conversation with her. She was there for several minutes and she advised those friends that she was going to be hanging out with a different friend in the, the city of Middletown. And she declined to go into the party at that moment in time. We're giving you quite a few locations here, so if you need a frame of reference, check out the map in our show notes. So, Megan is seen by friends in her car outside a party at Greenway Terrace, but she drives off without going inside. She told at least one person that she did not want to go inside because Edward Holly was there. Now, remember, Edward Holly is the guy she recently broke up with. Lieutenant Natalizio describes where Megan went next. We know that she did go to the city of Middletown and she, she hung out with another friend in the city of Middletown at that house until about midnight. Shortly after midnight, we know that she was back to the area where this party was on Greenway Terrace in, in the town of Wallkill. That's significant. Why did she come back to this location? What was bringing her back there? That question is now answered in a court filing where police described that Megan had made numerous phone calls from the Middletown residence looking for marijuana. The police filing says that Megan left the Middletown residence at about 12 midnight, telling friends that she was going home because she had to work the next day. About five minutes later, she's seen at a nearby gas station asking the clerk for a Dutch, a cigar used to smoke marijuana. About 10 minutes later, around 12.15 a.m., Two witnesses see Megan pull up at that party on Greenway Terrace, the one that she didn't want to go to earlier. She tells one of the witnesses that she's going to smoke a blunt. And just a couple minutes later, Megan is seen driving down Cindy Lane, coming from the direction of Greenway Terrace. Lieutenant Natalizio describes Megan's route as she left Greenway Terrace for the second time. From there, we know that she traveled in her vehicle believed to be alone at that point, but we, we know that she traveled in her vehicle down Cindy Lane in the town of Wallkill. We do have information that she was going to be meeting other individuals at that moment in time. However, that's the last time plot that we have. Police also indicated in the court filing that there were a series of calls to Megan's cell phone, which started during the late evening hours of March 13th and continued until 12.20 a.m. on March 14th. Those calls were from the man identified as suspect number two. Let me say that again. Suspect number two. 
Now, we can't confirm who suspect number two is or what they're suspected of, but more importantly, if there's a suspect number two, who is suspect number one? We'll get to that in just a minute. So, back to those phone calls to Megan from suspect number two. About five minutes after the last call, around 12.25 a.m., Megan pulls up at suspect number two's residence on Cindy Lane. Suspect number two gets into the front passenger seat of her vehicle. But according to what he said to police in a later interview, he tells Megan that he doesn't have any marijuana, at which point Megan tells him that she would be getting marijuana from Edward Holly. And there he is, suspect number one, Edward Holly. According to the paperwork filed in court, Police have inferred that it was as a last resort that Megan got, or intended to get, marijuana from Edward Holly shortly after her last outgoing call at 12.20 a.m. So, let's go back to the timeline. To recap, at 12.25 a.m., suspect number two gets into Megan's car, which had just pulled up in front of his residence on Cindy Lane. A witness from the nearby Kensington Manor Apartments next sees Megan's car, a white 1991 Mercury Sable, around 12.30 a.m., being followed by a dark-colored Honda Civic hatchback-style car with a loud stereo. During our initial interview, before police had named their suspect and before they made the arrest of Edward Holly, I asked Lt. Natalizio the significance of the hatchback with a loud sound system that was seen following Megan's car at the Kensington Manor Apartments. There is major significance to the hatchback. We have a good idea who's driving that vehicle that night. That is our suspect. Witnesses and DMV records would ultimately connect that car to Edward Holly. At the time we spoke with Lieutenant Natalizio, he wasn't releasing details about what the major significance was. But now because of the court filing by police, that suspect, suspect number one, appears to have been Edward Holly all along. Police allege in court papers that the connection of the purple Honda hatchback led them to infer that Edward Holly and Megan were together in the area of Kensington Manor just prior to the homicide. Police also say that cell phone records place the cell phones of Megan, Edward Holly, and suspect number two together at key locations on the night of Megan's murder. Once again, here's Lieutenant Natalizio talking about the timeline. It looks like they, they pulled in to uh, Kensington Manor. Uh, it has a, it's a big uh, circle parking lot, which leads back out to Fraser Road. Um, they pulled in from Fraser. Uh, they circled the lot once again, and then, then that resident observed the vehicles uh, a second time. The resident advised that what caught her attention was the loud sound system of the vehicle. It was, it was so loud that it stood out at that moment, especially that time of night in that community, which didn't usually have many vehicles traveling around with very loud music. So Megan's car is last seen driving in the parking lot at the Kensington Manor Apartments on March 14th in the early morning hours, around 12.30 a.m. Let's fast forward to later that morning. It's daylight. Now, we don't know the exact time of Megan's shift, but we do know that Megan doesn't show up for work. Throughout that day, her friends and family call her cell phone. They're desperately trying to reach her, but they can't find her. At about 1 p.m. the next day, March 15th, a couple of Wallkill residents who live on Bowser Road were walking along a dirt path just off their road when they came across the body of a female. They immediately call police. It was apparent that the woman was deceased and the area was preserved as a crime scene. The body is identified as Megan McDonald. The autopsy reveals that she suffered multiple skull fractures and brain injuries due to blunt force trauma. And just for your reference, where Megan's body was found off Bowser Road is about five miles from where Megan was last seen on Cindy Lane, and also about five miles from her apartment. According to court documents, Megan was killed on March 14th, sometime between 12.30 a.m. and 8 a.m., so, to recap, shortly before the time in which investigators believe Megan was killed, the subject, identified as suspect number two, told police that Megan pulled up in front of his residence on Cindy Lane, and he got into the front passenger seat of her car. And, as you heard earlier, he told Megan that he did not have any marijuana for her, at which point Megan told him she'd be getting marijuana from Edward Holly. According to those court documents, suspect number two was in the car when Megan was murdered. And on a side note, the man identified as suspect number two in court papers died the same year he gave that information to police. 
We've been unable to confirm the identity of suspect number two or his cause and manner of death. So Megan's body's been found, but police needed to locate her vehicle. They notified the media who broadcast a description of the car. Two days later, on March 17th, a resident of the Kensington Manor Apartments called police with the location of the white Mercury Sable. The vehicle is towed and forensically processed. According to court documents, evidence from the vehicle indicated that there had been a vicious assault. It appeared that Megan had been struck repeatedly in the head with a blunt object while sitting in the driver's seat of her car. Detectives canvass all of the locations where Megan was last seen, and they conduct hundreds of interviews. They've doggedly investigated this case for 20 years, but Lieutenant Natalizio said that back in 2003, witnesses were not immediately forthcoming. He explained that early on in the investigation, Edward Holly, or suspect number one, had a strong grip on his close circle of friends. But that was no longer the case. Those who once feared him no longer do. So in recent years, more witnesses have come forward with information. So why do police think that Edward Holly killed Megan? What was his motive? In court papers, police said that Holly was infatuated with Megan and that he was possessive and jealous. And even though Megan no longer wanted a relationship with Edward Holly, police inferred that Megan either got or intended to get marijuana that night from Holly, her main marijuana supplier. You'll remember that Lieutenant Natalizio said there was a major significance to Megan making a deposit to her HSBC account the day before she was murdered. About one year before, she had begun receiving $1,250 a month from her deceased father's NYPD pension. And on March 10th, just a few days before she was murdered, her account was overdrawn by more than $800. And this was the first time she had ever overdrafted her account. Edward Holly reportedly owed her money. He told police it was only $300, but another source said it was actually $3,000. Was this another stressor in the relationship between Megan and Edward Holly? Or was this another motive? But they also have Megan's cell phone that was recovered from her car, and it had both Megan's and Edward Holly's DNA on it. Police believe it was likely that Edward Holly went through Megan's phone and saw her outgoing call to an ex-boyfriend, causing Holly to go into a rage. And there's also DNA from the rear seat of Megan's car. Again, they identified both Megan's DNA and Edward Holly's DNA, leading them to believe that Megan was murdered while she was in the driver's seat of her car. And you'll remember that the location where Megan's car was found three days after her murder was just 500 feet from where Edward Holly lived at the time. Holly would have been able to clearly see the victim's distinct white mercury sable every time he left his apartment but he remained silent, according to the court record. And the dirt path off Bowser Road and Wallkill, where Megan's body was dumped, was a location that was familiar to suspect number two. In their court filings, police said that over the years, Edward Holly's stories and alibis were contradictory at times and disproven by witnesses. According to papers filed by police, it was during the first week of the investigation when state police interviewed Edward Holly. He told police that the morning after the party, he woke up to a phone call telling him about Megan's death, saying that he was told that they found Megan. Police noted that this comment by Edward Holly was just hours after she was last seen alive, and it was different from what Megan's family and close friends were saying. They described her as missing for over 40 hours. State police said that Holly never described Megan as being missing. They also indicate that Holly tried to direct and guide three different witnesses to not cooperate with the state police investigation. Mike Corletta of the New York State Police investigated this case along with Lieutenant Natalizio. Corletta said there were a number of resources used throughout the case. It's a complete team effort by multiple different agencies as we've listed previously with the FBI, the NYPD, the Orange County District Attorney's Office, Orange County Sheriff's it's it's been individuals at each one of these agencies that have helped bring the case to, to where it is today. It was on April 20th, 2023, 20 years after Megan was found on that dirt path in Wallkill, when Edward Holly was arraigned for her murder. He was remanded to jail without bail. But there was an issue. The district attorney said he'd only been notified of the arrest after it had been made. The DA responded with a press release, noting that the state police had previously said there would be no arrest without prior consultation with the DA's office, who added this statement, 
Grand jury presentations on cold homicide cases involving complicated fact patterns can rarely be commenced within six days without prior coordination. In New York State, the press release went on to say, once a defendant is charged and held in custody, the grand jury must vote an indictment within six days from the date of arrest, or the defendant must be released. And that's what happened here. Once Edward Holly had finished up some jail time for an unrelated drug charge, he was released. Various published reports at the time of Holly's arrest indicate that Holly has claimed he is innocent of the charges against him. As it would turn out, the district attorney had a potential conflict of interest from a time prior to his becoming DA. Various reports indicate that while in private practice, David Hoovler had represented a client who claimed to have information about Megan McDonald's death. Because of that conflict, a special prosecutor has since been assigned. At the time of our production, this case was still pending in the courts, and all suspects are considered innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. Although state police have made an arrest, you can still share your tips and information. If you have a piece of the puzzle that can help investigators regarding the murder of Megan McDonald, call the New York State Police Major Crime Confidential Hotline at 845-344-5370. And check out our show notes for a timeline, map, and pictures. Thanks for listening to APB Cold Case. Tell us about your cold case at apbcoldcase at spawngroup.com. APB Cold Case is an original Spawn Group production.